Tai Am Ann Rieselbach, the League's Program Director, and I welcome you back this afternoon to the first session, Drawing is Thinking. We're going to screen a video, Drawing is Thought, created by the great team at Spirit of Space last year. And then in succession, you're going to hear from Stephen Hall, Marianne Ray, and Nicholas Olsberg. E poi beh, lei sa meglio di me, probabilmente ha studiato anche lei così mi sembra, eh? in principio. Um, this service that you perform, sir, do you, uh, do you use your hands? The service you perform, do you use your hands? Absolutely. That I make these drawings every day in the morning because, as you know, the mind from, from waking up has got all the subjective links. He communicates in the most effective way through a sharp pencil and a beautiful block of paper. He's always drawing, 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 drawing. It's the way he thinks. It's the way he argues points. You can see the buildings take shape. to challenge the idea of presentation uh, 25 years ago when I was a student, which I did not think the current mode of presentation was, would allow me to explore space in the way I can. This was really before computing was available to, to all of us. And the other thing was the idea of the projection, which I think became a very important, another a very important component, that project, the projection of the drawing becomes the way it kind of started, the idea of kind of deformation, distortion, through projections allows you to look at the building in very different ways. So every time you look at the project, you look at it completely differently, and that really became a design process. In architecture, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the final form of a built building. A drawing to me is a completed piece of architecture. A building is a completed piece of architecture. A photograph of a drawing or a photograph of a uh, architecture is a piece of architecture. I remember Dr. Eisenman coming to Berlin and seeing these two pieces of the, uh, in this great hall. They were 50 foot high. And he says to me uh, uh, that they're not architecture because you can't get in them. And I looked at him and I said, you can't get in them. See? I, in other words, he was not in the position to get into them because he did not understand that. You can only get into something if you understand. To, to, to make something happen because that's like a miracle, it, it really uh, so sensitively trans, uh, transmit your ideas into a flat, two dimensional. Uh, right. Paper and uh, those traces are all smack blood come out exactly. of your vein. Well, it's a pleasure to be here in honor of Michael. I have to remember, I was only one year in New York City, and I went down to Princeton and introduced myself. I was nobody that Michael would ever know, but he was so kind, he gave me a, 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 a private tour of the Benassarov House. And I'll never forget it. And in fact, the I was just looking before this at the Hanselman House. It still haunts me today. The, the beauty of that amazing work. Um, I like Peter Eisenman's change of the title of this uh, to today as prologue. And that's all I'm going to do is a few uh, images. They're not images. They are the thought process on a few projects. I'll only show an image of the built building, but just to demonstrate this notion of drawing his thought. And for me, that holds to every project we've ever done. This is the first project I did in China, and I wanted to connect to China in some way, and uh, this is the first sketch I made on the site. 
Isasaki had appointed us to do the museum, which is a headpiece in a, in a collection of, I think, 16 architects. And uh, it took 13 years to realize it. But I was trying to connect via the idea of perspective. After the 13th century, Western painting developed vanishing points in fi fixed perspectives. Chinese painters, although aware of perspective, rejected the single vanishing point method, instead producing landscapes with parallel perspective, in which the viewer travels with the painting. So the idea of this building was, like these scrolls, that the bottom part in, in bamboo form concrete would be in parallel perspective, with warped uh, sense of space, while the upper uh, uh, galleries would be a single loop, going back connect to the city of Nanjing. And you can see that those, those drawings came very close to that idea. Another project in China, I decided not to pay attention to uh, what the program was because it was so complex, it could be everything. And the idea of raising the whole building off the ground, going up to the height limit of, I forget it was 50 meters, because there you could see the sea, and turning the landscape below into a public space. This is a competition and all the other entries, none of them tried to do this. And you can see these, these are for the competition drawing, where the landscape, this building that's going to be a horizontal skyscraper, floats above. We won the competition in July 2006 and the building opened in 2009. You can see that in China things move very rapidly. Basically it came from a, a series of sketches on a 5 by 7 notebook pad, which I still use. And also the details, I don't stop with the big concept drawing, but the details, the concepts of the details. Here, the louvers are taken from a palm frond. I just inverted the palm frond and made that the cut that became the custom louvers, and you can see. So this process for me continues in every project every day. Sometimes you get lost in the beginning, you can't start. There are some 20 individual schemes. There's 101 drawings for this house in Korea. I hated them. I, I just, it was total freedom. They came to me. They wanted a place for a gallery and music. It was free, totally free, total freedom, you know. And uh, that's sometimes dangerous. And I, I decided to take a score from a piece of music that was never played by a man by the name of Anhalt, Isfan Anhalt, a piece was from 1967, and I used that score. You can see that's the first sketch, and there's the derivative, the score idea, and I turned the, the score into skylights, 55 skylights, and the three pavilions would come up from a sheet of water, and that would form the building. And there's a simple thought that most of the galleries and most of the spaces below that sheet of water, while well, these three pieces of the building slide up. And so the whole thing was developed on five by seven drawing pads and presented, actually I only had 15 days after working on the project for six months and not liking any of the schemes, I had 15 days left before I went to Korea to present it to them. And uh, I had to present it like this with these watercolors and uh, they loved it. And it, they built the whole thing, every detail, including special uh, acid, red copper that was made in Kansas City by Zaner. This is in Seoul, Korea. And I won't go into the, the concept of, of, of the building. I just want to show this, this idea that drawing is a form of thought between the mind and the hand. This is the Glasgow School of Art. It was a competition. <clears throat> we won in 2009. And my main fear was to be across the street from Macintosh and to actually do nothing in, this, in a way uh, that's the same as Macintosh, to try to reverse, to not to do detail on the outside, to try to reverse the sense of, but bring light into the building. And these were the first sketches. They were made actually a day after I visited the site. The, the, the idea, you know, it's mostly studio spaces, so that the idea would be cubic volumes, building 30 meter wide, 15 by 15 cubes, and this red line would be the sort of uh, and then here you see this notion of the structure where Macintosh's building is thick skin in stone bearing and thin bones in steel and wood. Our building would be thick bones in concrete 
and thin skin and recycled obscure glass. And this notion of moving through the building, that was, that was a key concept. The circuit of connection, abrasive collisions between all the arts. And the other things were that the, the building has no columns. It has what we call driven voids of light. And there you see them appear in that watercolor sketch for the first time right in the first month we started to do the competition. And I'm very proud of this building. It was very difficult because of all the controversy. And they use these driven voids of light as musical instruments. But I'm, this is not about describing these buildings. <coughs> this one is breaking ground on the 4th of December. It's the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts Extension. It was, a, a, again, a competition, so we had to go up against the best. I won't list them, but they were very great firms that we went up against. And my very first sketch is here, an ugly building, but there's an idea here, and that is get down to the river with this. That's what Edgar, uh, Edward Durrellstone's original building had before they compromised it and turned it into a box. If you go back and look in history, you'll see this amazing round building that comes down to the Potomac River, brings all the public down to the river, gets over that road. So that was basically the first time that we were, new in, were, in, the, were in the competition, getting down, and then this is a living memorial. This thing is really important, you know. There's three memorials, the Jefferson Memorial, the Lincoln Memorial, but Kennedy's is a living memorial. So that means it's about what's happening today and it's about referring to the arts and somehow engaging everything, the public, bringing the public closer to the arts. So we decided to make the building basically underground and bring it out with a Potomac Pavilion, an entrance pavilion, and a, and a glissando pavilion. And you can see how the building evolves on these five by seven pads. I have all of these sketches. This is uh, two years ago. And connecting to the arts and to music, glissando, the idea of a glissando is when you take a violin and you run a bow over every note, you get this kind of shape. And uh, that's been a struggle to keep that name because the director changes and then the new director doesn't want to have that name. But anyway, we're still surviving and uh, it's all intact. And this notion of connecting to the this, this space, the Potomac, the Memorial Bridge, and the Lincoln Memorial. So by breaking the building down into these pieces, you form these views across the landscape. That's the state of the building now. It's breaking ground on the 4th of December and it will open uh, David Rubenstein is a great client. He told the contractor, uh, don't give me any schedules. It shall be open on Kennedy's 100th birthday, 29th of May, 2017. And everything is in there. This, the Capital Fine Arts Commission has passed everything. We got through the Army Corps of Engineers with the floating Potomac Pavilion. And at Columbia University, I finally got to build something in Manhattan, but it's very far up on the tip. It's like one you know, one, a sort of two minutes walk, you're in the Bronx, but right there at 218th Street and Broadway, an athletic facility, and there was the first sketch. It was very ambitious. There were going to be dormitories and all these different buildings, but that wasn't really the program. And there's the first idea sketch. The note, it's a football, it's a place for the football players to come and, and work out. Uh, they have gyms, they have an uh, auditorium for coaches. So this notion of points on the line, points on the ground and lines in space, like a football play. That became the concept. How to execute that was something else again. But you can see that diagram up in the left, points on the ground and lines in space. And the building became a kind of gate. To, to Lee Bollinger wanted it to be a gateway building. It's, it's indicating in the corner that Columbia does have a campus up there and Baker Field and everything that's up there. So the building becomes a gate. And what's inside is really about the mind, uh, the body, and the mind body, where you're trying to understand as an athlete what went on in that play. You're observing yourself. So these three parts are the heart of the building, but points on the ground and lines in space is the main concept. And then you can see this notion of a gate and how these points would come down. And there's the building finished. I'm very proud of this building. I hope you get a chance to go up there and see it because the details were drawn also on five by seven pads and sent by my iPhone. Another thing that happened to me, I always drew on these small watercolor pads, but when you could photograph that 
with your iPhone and then send it to three people at the same time. Like I have an office in Beijing, I can send, I can send, I can copy everybody, and I don't have to take any phone calls. I don't take, I don't take phone calls. This phone's been shut off for three years, and I I communicate with the drawing. The drawing is the thought process, but it's also the communication, and it's much quicker than a computer drawing. So all the details in this building are also drawn. You know, the first sketch is drawn on this five by seven pad. This is a big competition for two million square feet of museum that we just won. Uh, we were competing against Rem Koolhaas and Zaha Hadid, and it's in Qingdao, China. It's the longest bridge across water in the world, and it has a T in it. And my idea was to connect that T to the morphology of the museums. So that T-shaped bridge connects, and then there becomes this kind of what I call light loops that connect the bodies of the museums. And then, so the museum is sort of forming this landscape, these light loops, which are two galleries wide, so you never have to backtrack. They form these landscapes between them. And there's ideas about Chinese polychromy on the undersides of the light loops. So these are the concept sketches for the competition. And uh, when, when one of the things, and I think you can see this online if you look for the video, it's one of the great videos that we do all our videos in-house on, on, on these projects. And uh, I think that was the video that we made, which is about six minutes long, is probably why we won this competition. So all of these are five by seven watercolors. And there's the model. And now we're in negotiation. We just found out the contract is coming through. Um, it's, it's really an exciting cultural project, probably only these kinds of things can, it's the size of the Getty Museum, you know, it could only happen in China. Another project in tai Taipei is for a necropolis. I'd never done a cemetery or even a grave. I did one time a grave marker, and I made, I had many, many drawings that I won't show you that I didn't like. I went on for another three or four months not liking what I was doing, and I just came to this notion that the circle is a kind of universal shape. And I began to draw circles that intersect. And I thought about the Borromean rings and the whole nature of life as a cycle. And the breakthrough was that these weren't going to be just circles. You could, the ni a nice thing about a circle is it can be centripetal, centrifugal, introspective, extrospective. But you can also circulate in an interesting way. And, you know, this, these are ash boxes. This is a place for Buddhist seminar, uh, uh, Buddhist uh, uh, different meetings, I think they're like three per year, sometimes a thousand people gathering, but most of the time it's just, it's like a columbarium. <clears throat> and there's a sheet of water, and it looks out at the Pacific Ocean, and under that water is photovoltaic cells. Matthias Schuller, the great engineer, has devised a way that these cells are cooled by the water, so they're like s sort of 50% more effective, and they're always clean. And there's enough photovoltaic cells in that sheet to to run the whole electrical for the complex. But that's the language which came from circles. So from circles to spheres, but the, the key for me was that when you intersect the spheres in different ways, you get these incredible spaces inside this place. Of course, I haven't shown these, the sort of ash box shelving, but this is, uh, I'm really excited about this project and it's supposed to start construction in May. And last, and that's the language, on, on five by sevens. So the last, I just want to show the secret project we're doing in the office. I always be, I think that drawing is the way of thinking, but I think that the way that we can supercharge our drawings kind of very rapidly going to the 3D, we have two big machines that print 3D models in our office. So I have two people working on this, together with Dimitra Zacharelia directing this kind of, we call it explorations of in. And we're intersecting a tesseract with Venn diagrams. But I wrote a little manifesto because this is a project really about research. The thing containing is not the thing contained. This notion of the in. Like music doesn't have an outside, doesn't have an elevation. It's only got an interior. So to study architecture freed from the purely objective, there's seven points. From origins of architecture, we explore in. In goes to the elemental core of architecture. 
In, all space is sacred space. The architecture of in dominates space via space. Intrinsic in is an elemental force of sensual beauty. In is useless, but in the future it will be used. Purpose finds in. In is like the plane of pure eminence by Deleuze, that last book that he wrote. And then we're moving towards materiality, so you get scale because you get the wood grain. But this is a project that doesn't have a site or a program, and it's been going on for six months. Thank you. Hi. First of all, I want to say how honored I am and how happy I am to be able to speak at this event, which honors my beloved teacher and mentor, Michael Graves. After studying art as a, um, an undergraduate, I was a practicing artist in Brooklyn, and at that time in the early uh, 80s, figurative art was making a comeback with people like David Solly and Julian Schnabel coming on the scene. I knew I had become only interested in abstraction, but I was looking for ways that abstraction might most deeply and directly relate to the human condition. I started looking at and becoming obsessed with the work of architects, Eisenman, Rossi, Hayduck, and Graves. As well as the entire history of architecture, I was becoming obsessed with architecture. Then a few years later, as a first year graduate student in architecture at Princeton, it was like a dream when Michael Graves uh, was on my final review of the year. Then it was like a wildest dream come true, when at the end of the review, he asked me if I would want to work in his office for the summer. Ooh, and I could still feel my heart racing <laughs> from that moment. Um, like I told Peter last night, I felt like I was just a kind of country bumpkin uh, fresh out of Seattle. So after arriving at the office and learning that I would be working on, um, in the product design studio, on realizing his design for a stool and then a chair, um, it was like I had died, it died and gone to heaven. Michael would feed me um, his amazing hand drawings that were so full of life and multiple interpretations. Translating all of these into two fixed static objects was one of the most challenging things I've ever done. And, and of course, they never did quite did justice to those amazing drawings. Michael, thank you so much um, for your life-changing teaching and mentoring. So we, we were asked to uh, show how drawing um, acts within our own practice in our, in our own work. I'd, I'd probably rather just keep talking about Michael's drawings, but in a sense, all of my drawing has come from Michael. Drawing is thinking, yes. When I started to think about all the other things that drawing was for me, three other verbs kept coming to mind. Drawing as making, drawing as narrating, and as occupying. One of the most powerful architectural experiences of my life happened when I was living in Turkey for four months, and part of this experience included a really great revelation about drawing. I got interested in the Gece Kondu, or built-in-one-night houses. Because of an ancient Ottoman law that still exists in Turkey, squatters can legally occupy a piece of land forever if they can erect a house in one night. <laughs> True. <laughs> And 75% of the urban population lives in these, in fact. So we documented a whole series of these houses, and we thought it would be really interesting if uh, we would ask the owners to draw their house to see how the owners perceive their house in relationship to drawing. As it turned out, it wasn't interesting at all. <laughs> <laughs> time, time after time, the owners would draw an idealized icon of the house. In fact, the door is not even in the right place. It should be on the long side in the middle. Um, they drew an icon of a house, an idea of a house, but they didn't draw their house. They didn't draw for what for us was really their house, the rooms, the space, the surfaces. So we had to make our own drawings. Then as we became curious about the origins of the one-room dwelling through the Gege Kondu, we ended up looking at the Neolithic city of Chatalhuyuk and at Anatolian nomadic tent dwellings. So my students and I spent several hours in this dwelling. It was a dwelling that migrated in, uh, to the city in the winter and then back to the countryside for the spring and summer. It was a space that was most, mostly fabric. The cushioned furniture and floor, the walls and ceiling and the full-bodied clothing seemed to form one continuous envelope of habitation. We remembered our idea of asking the owner, house owners to make a drawing of their house. And what happened next completely blew us away. I handed them my notebook and Gul Bayaz, the mother of a seven-girl family, um, she handed it to her eldest daughter. And she began dictating a text and giving instructions for a drawing. It went something like this. Our house is 12 meters square. It's built with nine trees, nine iron stakes, and nine hemp ropes. And then the instructions for the drawing began. First, the tent stakes are pounded. 
and I've animated the drawing to recreate that sequence. Then the poles are raised, the center pole, the corner poles, the mid poles, and the ropes are tied. Then they paused and chatted and they looked around the tent and looked at the drawing as if something was wrong or incomplete. Then Gul Beaz, the mother, um, instructed her daughter to draw an outer line and hatches to represent the sloped sidewalls and volume of draped fabric. Magically, as scripted by the inhabitants who assemble and disassemble their dwelling twice a year, this plan and construction drawing had become spatial, a material, and volumetric. This was drawing as thinking, it was drawing as making, it was drawing as narrating, and drawing as occupying. There's a kind of joy that comes in making working drawings. Um, it allows you to replicate and anticipate the sequence and process of the actual construction of a building or space, determining every bend, every recess, every location of sheets of plywood, um, every location and proportion of openings, drawing as making. In our project for the facade for the Museum of Jurassic Technology called Wrapper, we invented 40 different possible uh, surfaces for the facade. And for each of these, there was a collage drawing sampled from existing drawings of Diderot, Piranesi, Ledoux, the Napoleonic edition of the Monuments of Egypt, as well as New York Times photographs, um, Scientific American photographs, and other contemporary sources. And these were all printed on papers that we had collected from around the world. And then they were spliced together in various ways. And then for each of the 40, uh, proposals, there was also a text, a narrative, that described the working details of materiality and how these would be fabricated. Lars Lehrer uh, wrote about this project. He said that the images reminded him of Mech's Ernst etchings while the texts read like popular mechanics. So for instance, the text for this surface um, called Strata reads, car windshields, bumpers, beer bottles, old drapes, LP records, tape cassettes, discarded shoes, broken air conditioners, etc are compressed, sliced into thin layers, and stacked to compose a stratified wall as if one cut into the earth to reveal the layers of a previous civilization. In this drawing called Loom Large, the facade is a giant loom that's constantly producing additions to an endlessly changing fabric surface or facade. In this project, quick drawings were used to narrate and develop the narrative of a procession along the Arroyo Parkway in Pasadena and you know, we have thousands of drawings like this in our studio. The storyline include, included the Rose Bowl parade that takes place there, and how once a year the floats um, make their way through the street. Um, then arrow to the uh, right, we proposed that for the rest of the year, the entire street would become a float, a spatial float that the Pasadenians could move through, through every day. And one of the characters that helped produce the street as float was the galloping multimedian a lushly planted undulating surface, the medians. And this is a drawing that experiments with, uh, yes, maybe putting the scale figure in the drawing, but also having the picture plane cut through uh, our plane of vision, um, sort of collapsing those, those two. Mysteriously, drawing can allow us to occupy spaces that don't yet exist, spaces that no longer exist, or spaces, spaces that partially exist. At the end of the 20th century, we worked at Hadrian's Villa for three months every summer um, for 10 years with about uh, 200 graduate students of architecture, measuring and documenting the many buildings and spaces uh, left there by Hadrian. For us, this work was a way to occupy these spaces. It was never really our thing to sit on a rock in the shade and sketch uh, the ruins. Um, for us, making these drawings allowed us to live in the spaces, to move within them, to touch them, to occupy them. This is the Canopus. And the Piscina Ovale that turned out actually to be a small gladiator's practice amphitheater. And an underground ice storage structure. And we always had it in our heads that we were in fact redrawing and reoccupying an existing drawing. And that was Piranesi's um, drawing that's less famous than his Rome drawings, but, but his magnificent drawing of Hadrian's Villa. Finally, as a, another way of occupying space, we've experimented with using photography, or maybe we could say abusing photography, to convert it into a means of drawing. 
This is from a project called Partly Underground Rooms for Water, Ice, and Midgets, and it's part of the pamphlet architecture series. It's one of Stephen's brainchilds and one of his many unique contributions to the discipline. Um, and thanks to the American Academy in Rome for the time to do this project. This was an experiment with photography to trace across the surfaces of a space to produce an unrolled um, interior elevation. It allows us to see and occupy the space in a way we can't when we were actually there, unless we move through it and somehow put it into our memory. And this is a drawing of that space. It's the Pozzo di San Patrizio in or Orvieto. This photograph slash drawing traces over the horizontal and vertical surfaces of an Etruscan tomb to produce a kind of fold out drawing. And this is a kind of hybrid uh, composite of a plan, a section, and that folded out surface in the lower middle. And a plan drawing photograph of a northern rural Chinese house. Nicholas Olsberg wrote about how Carlos Scarpa was thrown out of the academy for dwelling too long on how to sharpen the pencil. I'm known, I'm known for telling my students, graduate students who are like 25 years old, um, that they need to learn how to hold their pencil. They need to relearn that practice. So you don't hold it like this, you, you hold it like this. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, it's basically like primates can do this and eat their bananas, but humans are the only animal that can do this. Um, it's really one of the defining aspects of us uh, being human. And in an al almost last ditch effort to, in my teaching to keep the hand drawing alive, I like to quote from this book, The Hand by Frank Wilson. Um, the subtitle, even more important than the title, how its use shapes the brain, language, and human culture. So it's not as simple as the brain just telling the hand what to do, but the hand actually develops and change, uh, changes the brain. Wilson talks about the history covering millions of years of the hand and brain collaborating directly. And this is, has made us animals become capable of making, of having language and culture. And it's given us the gift of drawing. Thank you. Hello. Marianne and Stephen will be with us again very soon. I, you've already stolen one of my stories about drawings, but I've got four or five more to start with. Um, one that indirectly involves Stephen Hall, that many, many years ago at the Canadian Center for Architecture, we did a little drawing show curated by Carol and Michael Reese um, on the persistence of the sketchbook. I think it's the only time anyone's ever tried to do it. Um, and Stephen was among those who had the exact same sketchbooks. This is in 1989. Um, on display then that he's still using now. Um, and it's one of the fetishes of the drawing architect, uh, the need to keep on using the same size, the same volume, the fits in the same pocket, the same pencil. And this sort of fetishism has a cultural purpose. I think it controls and it disciplines, it structures the process of drawing, which sometimes can be too free. But one of the things that happened then is we talked about what, how valuable they were or weren't valuable. Did they matter? Did a preliminary drawing, did a sketch taken in, in the taxi coming in from the airport mean anything? And Tony Predock threw, pulled one out of his sketchbook, folded into a paper airplane and threw it across the room and said, no, they don't. Um, and I went up at the end of the day and there was a guy on the floor looking for a paper airplane. Um, to put back into his sketchbook. So there is an enormous amount of ambivalence about the value of drawings, their preciousness, their preciosity, we don't want. Their preciousness as cultural records, as records of thinking is very important. I think they're also, we're talking about drawing as thinking. I think we also should acknowledge drawing as non-thinking, that the automatic drawing, the spontaneous drawing, the quick doodle can have enormous meaning as well, and that sometimes a great designer will get the revelation, what he or she wants to say next, through that, as a much through an analytical thought process. Another short anecdote, I was staying in Tato Ando's guest flat in Osaka. Um, one has to be terribly careful in Japan, as you all know, about breaking rules that you didn't know existed. Um, and one of the things that was there was by the telephone was a very nice pad and a pencil sitting there like it is in a hotel room, presumably to note the arrival of my friend who was coming from Hong Kong, and which I promptly did. I was called into the studio the next day to show, 
be told that I had used Ando San's drawing pad and I was to leave the apartment that night. Um, and I said, but it was by that, no, that's where he draws when he's on the phone. There's a drawing pad wherever he stops in his daily routine. So um, this, uh, another form of near fetishism, um, the way Ando dresses, you actually couldn't put a sketchbook on you anyway, so I guess he does need to have them all lying around. Uh, but um, one or two thoughts. I, I wanted to remind us that architecture is a social vehicle. It is a metropolitan form, it's a rural form, it's a functional form, but it's also an object of desire. And a lot of drawing is about architecture as a desired object. I think we should never forget that the orthogonal drawing can be beautiful, and the orthogonal plan, and the orthogonal section. And here we have a drawing, I'm going to, sh I'm going to show you three roofs. And the great roof guy is Mansar. So here's a Mansar drawing. And you'll see he's trying to work out the cupola. But in order to do so, he's had to draw the entire scheme in not quite a section, not quite an elevation, but at least where the roof is, it is a section. And one of the things we might see later is in such orthogonal drawings, the weight of the pencil, the weight of the line, the thickness of the line, the heaviness, even the the fact that you seal together two sheets together to get the right scale all seem to me so significant. And look at the joins here that he's really looking at as much as what he's going to do there is the joins. So it's an instructive drawing for us. It was an instructive drawing for him. It wasn't the final solution to this, tr this, this sort of steeple cum cupola in Versailles. But it's also an object of real beauty and of desire. Gunnar Asplund doing just the same thing for his very first sketch studies for the Woodland Chapel, the main, main temple. In order to figure out what he's gonna do with that cupola, essentially he has to redraw the whole thing because when Asplund shortens a door handle by an eighth of an inch, an entire new drawing set has to be produced with a different framing system, because once that proportion shifts, so does the proportion of every conceivable thing in the building. It's why he didn't build very much, and I think it may be why he died young. Um, <laughs> but there is another drawing story about this drawing, which I showed a similar drawing to Ingmar and Hans Asplund, his two sons, once, and said, tell me about what you know about your father's drawing. I know you were very young, and he, you only saw him at weekends, because Aspen had two families, um, and he would see his boys only at the weekend, and he would drive over and pick them up, they said, and then we would get on the boat to go to the island where the summer house was. He would give us the oars, take out his sketchbook, and then we would see him that night. We did the rowing, he did the drawing. Um, and this sort of idea of the compulsive drawing actually wasn't very good, uh, as you can see. But the idea that you have to draw every single element of the structure every time you rework the roof. Another cupola in, a, in its way, which is mm, Michael Grazer's, one of his many, many sheets for the, the, the Portland building. And here you'll see that in fact that facade is pretty much all worked out by now, including where the window frame of that great window is to be, these two projecting forms, the little indent is there. But now he's figuring out and what amazes me about a drawing like this is a suggestion of a projected plan and then the unconscious genius of the placement on the page. It may be just that it was ha hadn't happened to be, but it can't go in the wrong part of the sheet. It's got to look right somehow to be studied well. Everyone at an angle, as you see, um, ex except the one that gets to sit, to sit on the building. As you know, it wasn't actually uh, this element wasn't actually put on. It didn't get the finial. Um, and then Peter Eisenman drawing house two, which we saw images of this morning. Um, and here I'm looking at the wall. That's, I guess the second main feature. Architect, every time you draw a wall, you are talking about the space behind the wall and the volume behind the wall. And here is Peter studying it to that extent. And Paul Rudolph studying the same kind of thing for the Southeastern Massachusetts 
university where this is the base form that will then appear throughout the building and organize it completely. Like Mansart, you see Mies strengthening the weight of the pencil on the joints, which is what he cares about. One of the things I wonder about and that we should start talking about, how big is the sheet? What's the medium used? Which direction did the hand move in? Did it start with the joint and move down? Almost certainly. Um, it's just lines. Uh, what's happening? Where is, why is it there on the page? I see that all Stevens were, in, in fact, placed very, very centrally on the page. Uh, an, another madman, Raphael Soriano, who in order to do the right thing actually experiments dramatically with medium. So this is a animation film studio cell was his base medium, and then he applied pastel to it. And Soriano's real focus is, ne is never on the volume behind because it's always transparent, but it's always on the plants, which he actually measures to a T over their 15-year lifespan before he figures out the exact proportions of the building. So the proportions of a house for Soriano were always developed according to the proportions of the plant life immediately in, f in front of you and how, that, how those proportions would change over the years. I, I think one of the great draftsmen of all time. Uh, his drawings are amazing. So that's the wall, and now the volume metric form, the form itself, the molded sculpted form. And this is Hugo La Pietra looking at monumentalizing the perimeter of the, the uh, disorder, disorderly city with these very emotive, very shaped forms. And I love, in this case, the use of the stippling to draw and then the shadows which in fact give you scale, there's no staffage to help you with scale, but you somehow see the urban and metropolitan scale that these are at. I uh, just found this at Adolfo Natalini's studio the other day. This is from a sketchbook um, in Rhode Island in 1972 when he's thinking up Super Studios, <laughs> Continuous City, translated to Manhattan, the collage we all know and that we actually saw this morning and reminding me that what you don't really see on the collage, but can see on the drawing, that it is a mirror of the sky. The one thing you can't see in Manhattan is what they capture in this. And so it becomes a much more romantic pro project than we had I imagined, I think. Um, and I think there's a suggestion of collage already there in that you use two mediums, one for the real and one for the intervention. Um, and I think that brings me to a, a, a Cedric Price drawing for another hung above the air plan, which is to raise Battersea Power Station above a new housing complex, which is his solution to preserving the landmark, probably practicable, but by using stamps on the bottom, um, or stamp-like images, and then s this on the top, it's a very small sheet, it almost feels like a collage. It has a layering that you cannot achieve in a digital process. And the sense of the hand is somehow there, even in a drawing as mechanically thought as that one. And then collage, I think architects were doing it nearly the first. So this is a collage by Carol Loder from 1934. So in order to get the vast scale of drawing that he wanted to achieve and the neutrality, he did it through a collage. And this is a faded piece of blueprint paper that he had to use as to represent the sky. And the construction paper on that side for the earth. Um, and I think these are very, very ingenious techniques that we are losing totally in presentation of architectural representations at this time. Uh, the physicality, the layering, the tactility of this kind of drawing. This is Ernest Born for a house uh, not built in, in San Francisco where the idea is taking a portion of the photo of the model and then extending it through drawing. And again, not in this case placing it within the frame exactly, spilling the frame, twisting the object, um, not just to startle, though I think part of it is, but also to get a sense of the continuity of house in the landscape. Um, so it's not a 
it's not a thinking drawing, it's a drawing to make us think, which I think is a very important feature. Now a real collage by Super Studio, in which you see their grid superimposed over their 13th city, or the 12th, I think, is the, the spherical one, in Meteor Crater. Uh, and then a collage by Cedric Price again. In this case, this is in four layers. There is a print on the bottom. This is for part of uh, uh, the let. There are some mylar strips above that. There is an empty space, and then there is a glass cover which has his interventions on it, which are these sort of channeled, channeled walkways, which were to follow the, the, the old routes of the canals or to emulate them. Again, not a thinking drawing, but a drawing to make us think about history beneath the future. And then my last one is a noodle doodle, scoodle, um, which are uh, absolutely critical elements <laughs> in the art of drawing. This is Adolfo C. Um, uh, Alvaro Caesar starting a meeting. I think it's for the Gestapo Memorial in Berlin, the m Memorial to Victims of the Gestapo. He starts the meeting, right, writes very neatly, organigram, construction system, there we go. and he does a little organigram. That leads him to think about forms, plans, <laughs> circles. Then imagery, the cattle car coming down the highway. Then things that he thinks or he means to say or might tell them that he's looking for equilibrium of form, uh, that he's looking for a simplicity of form, that he's looking for signification that might be open to many interpretations, even among one person, um, that everything could mean anything you want it to be desired to mean, otherwise the project doesn't work. And so he's got all these actually fundamental thoughts about what a meaningful, emotive, cultural object in the landscape of the ground or the imagination. That's what I think, that's where I think drawing tells us most about architecture. Architecture as that kind of object. Thank you very much. So, we're gonna to get together. I heard something very interesting this morning about Michael Graves' drawings being a way to make history for some aspects. That in fact, it wasn't just for your thinking, but it allowed other people, it allowed the viewer to think because you could animate something within a drawing that you cannot in, in another medium. Is, do, do, do you find that? You know, I, I have to say that my, I'm really interested in the, trying to stick to the title that the drawing is a form of thought. It's almost a polemic for me. I remember, I mean, to me, it's what's important are the ideas. I'm not really, you know, so I think that we're going to lose, we we're in this kind of transitional moment. Technology is, you know, running away with us. All these things are happening. But the thing that we can't lose are ideas. If buildings don't have ideas, this is really a tragedy, you know, and I, that's for me. I remember when I first, I, I'm just thinking about Michael Graves again. I remember when I first came to New York, there was an exhibition called Idea as Model. Michael, you remember that? And he did these posters where he did this strange fragment of a model. I think there were only like 25 posters issued by the Institute. And my friend William Stout has one of those in his bookstore in San Francisco. But that was like a, that's a proposition, Idea as Model, that there's, there's embedded in the model some kind of idea, and I, that's, I want to go back to that drawing as thought. For me, it's like, it doesn't matter, the technique, the type, which way the paper is, that's, none of that's important. To me, what's important is that architecture has meaning. And when you, per, you, know, when you see that what's happening now, when these renderings, these sort of, sort of deeply you know, literal renderings, they don't convey ideas. They just don't convey ideas. And, and I think, think that's, the, that's the problem. And, and we have a chance of losing even thought in architecture. You don't think that the medium chosen and the method of representation has an idea behind it? No, not necessarily. No. Do you agree? Uh, I mean, like, every drawing, like I don't use notebooks, so um, every drawing is kind of a thing in and of itself. Like whatever is being drawn sort of does, for me, require a different kind of medium, a different kind of paper, a different kind of size or scale. Uh, 
you know, so it does, for me, it, it does matter. And the, there is an idea communicated by the scale you choose to represent uh, it at. Absolutely, yes, yes, yeah. But for yeah. you, no, Stephen. Uh, I'm, I'm more interested in the idea. I mean, I, I also work in different different formats and different, and I think, you know, the key to an idea for me also has a visual, it has a direct link right. between the mind and the hand and, and the intuition and connecting all these three threads is, is in a way, it's a drawing process. It's a thinking process. Right. No, there's th there is a miraculous triangle between right. the head, the hand, and the eye. Right. All pointing in one right. direction, and th that is that is a moment of real thought, right. and it can be spontaneous, it can be analytical, it can be however you want it. I was I was intrigued by how many of your, your drawings have quite carefully written words on them communicating the key very idea. Very important, very important. And that is to communicate that key idea to somebody else or to remember the word for yourself? No, it's communicating the idea. Those, many of those drawings are the presentation drawings to the client, you know, and, right. uh, you know, points on the ground, lines in space is very easy to understand as a sentence, but if you see a sketch, you start to get the possibility that could right. be an architectonic Oh, you know, I mean, those things are working together. The words are just as important. What comes first, the, the, the words or the image? Neither one, it's intuitive. And, the, and you work back and forth. And it could take a series of days where you're drawing and thinking and you write something and then you write another thing, you draw another thing, and suddenly they start to converge and it becomes something, you know, something substantial that you can actually use as a force to drive the entire design of a building. It's, to me, this is like, that's what our, I believe that architecture has to have an idea that drives the design. It isn't just a series of incidents and, and, and sort of, you know, sort of whatever, you know, right. kind of trendy details or some sort of trendy skin draped over a structure that has no And the no idea is expression. always coming from a drawing. Is, yeah. it, is it developed as you draw? Absolutely, but I'm also, I'm, an, I'm kind of an old, I'm carrying on the modern project. You know, I'm part of Ken Frampton's legacy, right? I'm carrying, I'm carrying it on. So I think that structure, by the way, has to have something to do with the idea. I, I don't believe, you know, when, when structure is 25% of the cost of building a building, I think that the, I, the concept of the building has to intersect somehow with the structure. Yeah. And, you know, that's an old, you know, that's, we haven't used the word postmodern. I didn't hear that word yet today, but <laughs> Michael, you know, I never went that way with you, you know. I love the Benassar of House. I love the handsome house so much, you know. I love his early work so much and the paintings and the collages. What a brilliant hand, what a brilliant composition, what a brilliant mind, you know. So then, you know, he went a different way. I stayed, you know. And I think there's still a long way to go. I don't think the modern project is over. I think it's, it could be just beginning. Back, back to your thing about history as a living thing. I think um, I'm so grateful for my education at Princeton because you, you know through Michael, through Vidler, Colquhoun, uh, everyone who was teaching there, um, but maybe led by uh, Graves in a way, that that uh, it sort of made me realize that architecture, it, it's so different than the other disciplines. It's so different from literature or science um, in that you can go back to those buildings. They're still existing in physical space and time. And so they're open to us to continue to reinterpret them you know, to redraw them, uh, re-inhabit them. So, you know, when we were at Hadrian's Villa, for instance, we would eat lunch, and then we'd realize we were eating in the triclinium, which was the places, which were the dining rooms, and, and we were recreating that, you know, within the actual, actual space. Drawing's a, a plastic intelligence. It's a, concerned with conceiving, and always amazing to me, since I can't do it, that people can actually draw volume so rapidly and draw it at the same scale on the same page in two different ways so, so rapidly. But what is the translation between a plastic intellect and a two-dimensional object? It's, it's, it's the, you don't have to flatten it out. It can be three-dimensional in its inception. It, it, that's it's, the, it, that's, it the, that's, that's another reason why a drawing, you know, one of the reasons why I used to just work in pencil and charcoal and Year, and then around uh, 79, I started to do these water using watercolor because I could throw a wash of light. I could show which way the light is coming into right. the space, right. and very quickly, you know, quickly uh, sketching method, 
And so I think you see space, you see volume. It's possible to see the overlapping perspective. You can indicate the possibility and the direction of the light coming in. All those things can be indicated in a small right. spatial drawing. And I think that's, that, that's a form of thought, you know, a, a spatial idea, a unique spatial idea. You know, Did you starts... In the, in the tent drawing that I showed, um, it was so much for me that that thing that, that this thing was spatial. Yes, <laughs> it became spatial, and that was sort of the last comment. And and to understand that that was something within all of us as humans, not just those of us trained as architects, uh, was that was sort of the re revelation. That we all yeah. can draw three dimensions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we we can all draw volume. We can all draw space. We can all draw void. Mm. But you 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 actually bring light in. Whereas the traditional drawing method is actually to cast shadow, not bring in light. It's, a, it's an interesting well, you're bringing in time. differential. You're bringing in time. Yeah. A, a certain space in a certain position has certain sunlight coming in at an angle, changing over time. You know, it comes, it comes down to, yeah, uh, space and time. And the way to get at that and, and have an architectural idea, I have to have a three-dimensional immediate way to get into the space, the light, the time, the possible structure, all those things coming together at the same time. And you can't do it in a computer because it's pre-programmed. What program are you going to use? It's going to, it also has a bias, you know. Some programs, they start drawing pumpkin shapes, you know, if you start, you know, I mean, everything has a bias. Revit is terrible. It's like putting a straitjacket on yourself, you know. And then we're all forced to draw in Revit now, so you can't start the project drawing in Revit, that's impossible, you know. I mean, maybe we should all be designing our own forms of software. <laughs> right. I, mean, I mean, it's sort of like, you know, I, I only showed one thing that was sort of done through the interface of the computer. And of course, it's, it's deeply part of our practice to draw that way. And I guess sort of considering it, um, you know, it ends up being something between the hand and the brain. And maybe it's, it would be good to think of it as a kind of third participant, you know, in the conversation, uh, in, in a potential. It just feels like the software at this point is so limiting in terms of uh, driving. It's, it's almost forcing the converse it itself is. into the conversation as opposed to becoming kind of dialogue uh, between the two. So it feels like we're just in the very early stages, uh, very primitive stages of what that interface, you know, software is. Yeah. You draw with with somebody? Do you ever draw on your, do you, do you just draw on your own? Marianne, or do you draw with somebody there? Do you explain something through the hand? Oh, definitely, definitely. In teaching and, yeah, again, taking after Michael. <laughs> yes, yeah, I mean, you, he would sit at our desk and uh, this was talked about earlier, whether it was at the office or at, at, uh, in the studio at school. And being in his office was as much like being at school as was yeah. Being, being in the... So drawing to communicate as well as drawing to think. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe you're thinking while communicating, which is what, what, what I do when I'm talking, unfortunately, right. from <laughs> many people who have to listen to me. <laughs> um, what, how, how, would, how would you teach drawing? How would you get people excited enough to want to learn it? Uh, I don't teach drawing. We teach studio and we teach architecture as driven by an idea. And one of the ways that I teach at Columbia with Demetra is not to make them to make them work in models. So they have to have an idea that drives the design. I don't intend to have them copy me. In fact, if someone shows me watercolors on five by seven, I said, forget it. I mean, I disagree with that idea. As a teacher, I think you, you try to open the door as wide as you can to their possible, you know, their possible personal development, but I, I think that they get lost in the, in, in, the, in the sort of programs in the machine. So one way out of that is to make them really make models and make analytical models and, you know, make videos of how you move through them and how the light comes in to, to make diagrams about structure. So we let them use every possible electronic means, but we force the issue by not allowing, you know, sort of these kind of literal renderings to be part of the process. Yeah, I, I once saw Craig Hodgetts make a drawing at a restaurant at the end of a dinner um, to help somebody find their way back to their hotel. And he drew so slowly, so slowly. And he was like, he would close his eyes and he would remember something. And then he would draw that. It was like the surface of the back of a supermarket. This is in Los Angeles. So kind of making your way through this slushy, uh, strange landscape. Um, and that, that was a little revelation in terms of drawing for me too. 
Um, and so sometimes I talk to my students about, like they, they can't come up with the overall scheme or the diagram or the, the idea for their building. And so I say, why don't you just start at the front door or start in bed and draw the bed and work your way out from there and just take it really slow. But you, you, you have to be in that drawing. It was talked about this morning, I think, the occupying uh, the drawing. And that, that's been sort of an effective way in teaching, not in a drawing class, but in a, a design studio and how you design through drawing. And I think you can do that equally well in digital, in AutoCAD, you know, even a very simple um, thing where you have to construct each line, each space. And but you wouldn't, you wouldn't sit down and formally instruct drawing techniques or formally go through a history of no, only, architectural drawing. Only about drawing. how to hold the pencil. Only, the, only, you, uh, only how to sharpen the pencil. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, does anyone in the audience want to start talking about drawings and the, the, their role, asking questions too? I can't see. Yes. I once watched Oscar Niemeyer describe to me how he built Brasilia with a series of huge drawings. You know, big, big pieces of paper and his felt pen just going like this. It was amazing. Each building could be described in a kind of ideogram drawing, just how it was, you know, the plaza, the, the three powers, the, and also Niteroi, the church that's, or the uh, museum that's on one column. And actually, that was in, there was this moment of him sketching that. So even though, you know, when I was with him, you know, w we had to translate the Portuguese, but we, when, when he got up, and, and he had, to, in his office, he had these little bucket seats, six little bucket seats. It was like a little lecture hall. And we, when he wanted to tell you the story about buildings, he would draw them. Those are the thoughts. And uh, I still have like five of those drawings. When they fell up down on the floor, I said, can I take them? And he said, sure. And it, I mean, you can understand every building. You can understand, the, you, you know, the, 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 the Nineveh building, every building that he did in Brasilia. These are thoughts that he just, he's re restating them without Portuguese and without English, but you can, you understand the structure, you understand the, the idea of the building. It's very clear, it doesn't have to be complicated. And Mies used to do that all the right. time with his students. He sat with them and drew his buildings again and again and again in, in sketches that illustrated what the thought was behind them and what the constructive thought was. Eric Mendelssohn did it in a much more perverse way. So, I mean, he was again able to do it with one single stroke, and he represented the Einstein Tower more often than I would please. But um, when you really look hard at that Einstein Tower, one hand, one stroke sketch, um, it's actually based on a photograph and was nothing to do with how it was originally conceived. But then he sees the photograph, he gets the idea stronger, and he said, I think the idea doesn't have to be an origination idea. It can be an idea that comes r retrospectively, which brings me to a question. When do you go back to your drawings from 15 years ago, eight years ago, and why? Say again. When do you go back to drawings from expired projects, from aborted projects? How often do you go back to drawings? You mean to look at them? Or? Of your own, yes. No, uh, not too much. <laughs> no? No. So they don't have a continuing e e usefulness to you? Uh, yeah, no, I guess so, yeah. This is yeah. Stephen. I have, uh, over my desk, I have these boxes that are chronologically ordered. That's why I stay with five by sevens. They go all the way back to 1979, and I can find every first drawing of every project we ever did. and. Often I'll go back and I'll remember the date so I can go and chronologically pretty quickly find this drawing, which is a thought. And some thought might have valid, uh, you know, exactly. reincarnation in a completely yeah. different project for some other reason. Mm -hmm. So that for me, that's like a kind of second brain. It's a sort of second memory because the drawing has so much information on it, you can't exactly remember all of that. that a lot can be put on a piece of paper like this. So that for me is another, that's another memory bank. Right. Yeah, I, guess, I, guess I, could I could answer that uh, question better. Um, because the, you know, the, the verb uh, of drawing, that, that somehow just through the act of drawing, for instance, the buildings at Hadrian's Villa, um, they somehow lodge themselves within me. So I don't, in some cases, 
the act of drawing has embedded itself in the memory. But there are times, too, when there's specific proportions or a kind of stare that you remember, and yes, you pull those out and um, use them to kind of help. Yeah, help I mean, I mean there have been many, many ways of doing this. One is the layering that you were kind of referring to. Scarper actually kept the draw, and he would layer different solutions on trace and could actually see through them. So he might return to them because he took 14 years to do everything. Right? He might go back to them and look at that, look at them as a layer, and then and then develop the idea further. Quite some years after, the last piece in the layer was originally there. Do you like other people to go through them? Your, your drawings. I mean, do you enjoy opening them? Uh, not particularly, but it happens. No? <laughs> so they're, they're very much done for your own. For Absolutely. your own thinking they're, they're and for communicating to clients and communicating to people who are going to execute. Absolutely, they're 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 basically their thoughts and and they they contain the information to to launch a building design. Right. And that's I, I shouldn't say that all those I paint every day, so I do a lot of things that don't don't have any idea that's very clear. There's sort of blur blurs of space and shape and color and light and. They become thoughts later, maybe. So I, maybe I would say that half the drawings that I do every day, half of them are mm, unknown even to me, which is good. Yeah. No, I, I mean, mean that mystery part is really important. I think it's like what what is we live in such a literal world today. It's just so literal. I mean, where's the poetry? You know, I I, I have a big collection of poetry and I read a lot of poetry, and I think it's very Mm, healthy for the mind, connecting the intuition, you know, the spirit, the soul, the inner feeling, you connect to that, and that's the important thing, and I think we're losing that in architecture, and I, we've got to find ways to teach it, the ways to reintroduce it to this, I think that's the, the key, I'm, I'm, I've given up on the sort of corporate world, but I think the new generation can learn a different way, and we don't have to build everything with corporate firms anymore. Now, it's really interesting, especially in China. You know, you can have 12 people, which I have in Beijing, and you can build 2 million square feet. And you can direct it and give it the detail it needs to be given and, 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 and have a force that drives the design and, and just put everybody else at that task. So the days of you have to give the commission to the biggest corporate firm are over. I think the smaller offices with good a talent can now have a new, a new lease on life, especially in other countries. I, maybe it's not happening so much in America. You know, uh, Joseph Urban, who built a beautiful auditorium on 12th Street that the New School commissioned, that, that's where I thought this lecture was going to be. That's a beautiful <laughs> space. Huh? It's right? Coming. So we're not going to say anything about this building. Well, you can say everything you want about this building. No? Huh? You can say, it, 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 no. it, it's only worth talking about good things. There was no drawings. <laughs> I was very interested, though, that you said you spend half your time making, I mean, half the time your hand is moving in a pictorial fashion, well, let's call it that way. You are not thinking. It is a, sometimes you don't know where that's going. And I think it's why I showed that last sh sheet from Alvaro. Right which is where he's just writing down a note in a meeting and suddenly something comes, he doesn't know what it is. Right. And uh, I think that the act of drawing this verb actually animates something. And the fact is that if you're sitting there with the ruler doing a measured drawing, the imagination is not quite in play. But I think the moment you've got that haptic thing going on, that physical action, right. it may draw something out that you didn't know was there. Exactly. And to me, that's absolutely fundamental to this process. Right. I, I, I have thought, because th this is a little bit too didactic to say that drawing is thought, because when I'm making the drawing that we don't know what the thought is, but I know there's some potential yeah. in that. And I found this quote by Deleuze, Deleuze on cinema. He said, ideas are types of potentials. That's very interesting. Maybe it's not a concept yet, it's mm -hmm. not something that drives the design, but ideas are types of potentials, which I think is a very interesting way to think about drawings that don't quite have a thought yet, but could be. 
You know, I, I was just, last night I had dinner with the artist Roxy Payne, who I really think is one of the great artists working today. And he starts with drawings. Every single thing he does starts with quite detailed drawings. These dendro, dendroid series of the stainless steel, they're all drawn out as large watercolors, you know. All of his work starts with drawings. So I think it's very interesting. I mean, that's a very young artist, super popular. Maybe, you know, drawing is not dead, you know. I think uh, it's a kind of thinking. Well, it was interesting yesterday to see the Motherwell series um, of automatic drawings, which he did. He found Japanese rice paper to particularly like, bought an enormous sheaf of it, 1,000 sheets, and said, I'm going to devote this year to 1,000 drawings on this. And every morning he selected the paint choice, and then every day he did 15 to 40 of these drawings where thought had to be so rapid that he didn't know what it was going to be. And you, you end up with an enormous amount of ideas that become instrumental years later. Just think, yeah. al al allowing the release to come out, and I think drawing is one of the great vehicles for that. It's like, it's like singing. If we could sing like in the Wallace Stevens poem, if we could just sing like that, some order would emerge. Um, and I think that's, that's, a, that's one of the acts of drawing we don't talk about in architecture, right. this, the, the spontaneity that can produce something else. Marianne. At, lunch, at lunch, I was talking about a, uh, how at SciArc we had a series of um, drawing auctions, and we would ask uh, architects from all around the world, you always donated, Michael, uh, other people would send in the small drawings, do you remember that? And then we'd have an auction and um, you know, raise a few hundred thousand dollars, actually, for um, student scholarships. So uh, we started doing them two years apart, so we, we did one, then the next year we did another one, and it just brought up huge crowds, and it was like a, just in amazing exhibition and these drawings were just like like the energy was seeping out of them <laughs> into the space of the gallery then there was then the software came in and i think we had a bigger gap of time there but the drawings were all um, printed on glossy paper they were all renderings and they had magic mar marker signatures on them not one drawing sold and the other thing every drawing sold out including uh, Philip Johnson, who is the only person who refused to uh, give us a drawing, who instead wrote a letter of, sorry, I, I cannot oh, do a letter, that. but we sold that too. <laughs> 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 that went for more than most of the drawings, actually. <laughs> right, right. But, but it was just such a difference of seeing people in the exhibition space. They, they basically went back out to the bar. They didn't spend time in the room. And not one single drawing sold. I mean, the, the value difference. And, and again, I, I don't want to you know, just talk about the great divide at this point, just to say that, that the, the interface may be, we're in this very primitive um, state of things with that right now. I, I'm just glad you saw that. It reminds you of the incredible Samuel Beckett story where somebody asked you to write something in a book and he wrote, no, never, which was a great, it could have been a whole play, of course, by Sam. Um, anybody else have a question or two just before we take a break and go to the next session? Yes. They all look the same. Right, and they, and they very seldom have ideas. That basically it's what I would call a euphoria of technique. And I think it's gonna pass because it doesn't have depth of meaning. And a lot of people are saying the same thing that you're saying in schools all over the country. How many schools of architecture are there? They're like 130 or something like that. 147. This, this, is being, this, is, this is what's being told, you know, everyone's realizing this. It's just gonna, we're just gonna change it. And, and, and be able to express ideas again. So like if you come to my class, there's no, none of those drawings. They're models and they're different te techniques used to express light, you know, kind of rubbings and kind of reliefs and ideas of, or what we're trying to express. And we don't, we don't have any of those renderings because the renderings, they're for se those are for corporate uh, presentations to sell development projects, you know? To, you know, it sends us basically back to Renaissance Italy because it's biased in perspective, you know, as the projection mode. So I think it's, it's really a kind of, I mean, don't think of it as a deficiency in you. It's a deficiency in the software. And the more you can abuse that software, the better. And I think software, uh, the way it's designed today, is not, doesn't open itself an, up enough to abuse. Uh, for instance, we tried to do a Chinese parallel perspective in software. 
and we even got some experts in, it can't be done. Right. No, no the but, yeah. Which you can produce that kind of drawing. Right. That, so, that, 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 the, what I was trying to sure. make yeah. with, with the sort of, yeah. Yeah, at the moment. With the lack of a vanishing point. So you're, you're kind of living in an awkward age where the tools are kind of pretty dumb. Um, <laughs> you guys are, want to be smarter. And you, um, but, but, you know, maybe there are ways to abuse it through, you know, different kinds of software by bringing it out into the physical world, putting it back into the digital, uh, whatever maybe you could do to, to get your hands on it. That, that I think one of the fundamental things is there's no precision to a backlit line. There is no real edge to it. It's very, very disturbing to me. I cannot, I'm not good at reading perspective always anyway, but I cannot read an axonometric online. I don't know which is the back and which is the front. You get so lost, and I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure I'm not u u u unique in that. In fact, it cannot do what a drawing can do for those very reasons, and the weight of line never feels the same. And, um, Yeah. Um, and that could be printed. Yeah, my, the mic, I'm speaking loud, my microphone's not working. Right. The microphone's not working. Um, Michael wrote an amazing article called The Necessity of Drawing, and that should be printed out and in every lap in this uh, auditorium um, for, for this discussion. But, but he talked a lot about the, the wiggly line, and when I talked about how he would hand us drawings or make drawings in front of us that were so full of life and multiple interpretations, it was, you know, the kind of wiggle of the line that, that could contain the kind of multiple uh, layers. Good. That seems like a good point to stop. We get back to Michael where we began and where we ought to be. So thank you very much.